Well, hello again, and welcome back to HS211, History of the Restoration Movement. In this module, we will discuss one of the more visible aspects of the Restoration Movement, the repudiation or the dismissal of symbols in worship. Now, most people who visit Restoration Movement churches for the first time usually note how symbols are pretty few and far between in their sanctuaries. The stained glass windows often have little to no pictures. The crosses in the sanctuary are usually wooden and unadorned. Even the communion tables are usually made from plain wood and look more like a table than an altar with very little religious Im imagery on them. And while we could probably focus on half a dozen types of symbols that were conscientiously rejected by the pioneers of the movement, in this particular lecture, we will focus on the theological and historical developments that caused the Restoration Movement to avoid the use of vestments and other types of clerical clothing, the kind of clothing that show which people are clergy and mark them as a unique class of people. Indeed, many within the Restoration Movement will latch into this idea that every believer is a priest, and their dismissal of clerical garb will be a very concrete manifestation of this belief. So, this will be our trend for long durée lectures, but I would like to begin by making an observation about an aspect of life that you probably haven't thought about in a while. And that aspect is this, that uniforms are an important part of life. So, try to think about the kinds of occupations that use uniforms. Doctors wear lab coats and scrubs. Police and military have specialized uniforms. Even the workers at Walmart wear navy blue shirts and khaki pants to tell them apart from the customers. You see, uniforms are symbols that convey a large amount of information quickly. Depending on the uniform, a casual glance could reveal a person's occupation, such as, is this person a flight attendant or a pilot? It could reveal a person's status, such as, is this person a regular cook, or are they the head chef at a restaurant? It could even communicate that a person has special rights or privileges, such as, a police officer has the privilege to place a person under arrest if they suspect them of doing something illegal. Now, for the most part, we have internalized much about uniforms in our culture because we run into people wearing uniforms all the time. And we trust that a person in a uniform is able to do a specific job. And we will even defer to them as experts, even if we know nothing about them other than they are wearing the correct uniform that corresponds with the job that needs doing. And it's for this reason that uniforms are tightly regulated. And the more authority accorded to a person in a certain type of uniform, the more likely it is to have legal ramifications for attempting an impersonation. So, for example, in our slide here, we have a uh, comic from, a, uh, from the internet known as XKCD. And in this comic, this guy in a doctor's uniform says, Well, it'll be until the second trimester and the baby hasn't decided which opening it will exit through. The pregnant woman is obviously frightened by this statement and says, What? And the fake doctor goes on to say, well, we'll hope for one of the lower ones so that it won't be fighting gravity. And the caption on the comic here is, did you know that you can just buy lab coats? Suggesting that with the correct uniform, a person could do quite a lot of damage because the uniform allows them special access to people and to special access to certain jobs. But what about religious uniforms? The technical term for a uniform that was created for sacred purposes is known as a vestment. It's a word that comes from Latin, from the word vestarius, which means simply to dress. Now, if you come from a Restoration Movement church, this term may be new to you because very few Christian churches use formal vestments. It is usually only in very rural or traditional churches that the choir will wear a formal robe, and even then, they're probably viewed as optional. However, it is worth noting here that most religions use some form of vestment in order to distinguish their ordained clergy from the unordained laity. And the ones that don't often use them uh, 
basically still expect a certain dress code to be respected. Just to give an example, in my home church, it is expected that I will wear a suit and a necktie every Sunday when I preach, and that I will wear a simple white robe when I perform a baptism. And so all of this is to say that even churches that have dismissed the idea of vestments still have strong expectations that the people affiliated with their religion will dress in certain ways that reflect well on the congregation. Now, one of the interesting ways that this plays out um, is the way that churches self-identify their worship style. Churches that use vestments tend to call themselves liturgical churches, while churches that do not use vestments but still advocate for professional dress tend to call themselves traditional churches. Churches that have a casual dress or even a relaxed dress code uh, for their ministers often go by the designation contemporary churches. So when a church offers multiple worship styles, or at least multiple worship services, often the minister will change his attire to reflect the expectations of the worship style. Now, as your professor, I feel it is significant that the early advocates of the Restoration Movement wholeheartedly rejected vestments, even though most came from churches that had a pretty good opinion of church uniforms in the past. And how this process happened will be the subject of the next few slides. But before we get into the theology of the history of vestments and their repudiation, I want to have you turn a few questions over in your mind first. So think about these sorts of things as you go through the lecture here. What does your pastor's Christian uniform look like? Is there anything about the way that they dress, either in the pulpit or when they're out in public, that lets you know that they are Christian? Try to brainstorm some possible benefits that wearing a uniform that tells everyone you're a Christian. Try to think of how that could be beneficial. Also, try to think of some downsides to this wordless type of communication. How do you think the world would be different if every saved believer wore something that testified to their faith? So process these questions over in your mind a few times as we embark on this whirlwind tour of what the Bible has to say about specialized religious attire. So we'll go ahead and turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 28 and go ahead and read the entire chapter here before we continue. Go ahead and pause the video for a bit, and we'll resume this discussion once you have read this entire account. Okay, so now that you've read that, in this chapter, God commands Moses to make a special set of holy vestments for Aaron and for his son, so that they may be identified as Israel's priest. It is interesting to me that this command comes from God himself. This is not a matter of Moses and Aaron simply giving themselves permission to have the best wardrobe in town. No, this is God's idea, and his reason for doing it is fairly simple. It is to give Aaron and his sons a sense of glory and beauty. And it's because they perform an important spiritual job on behalf of Israel, and that their garments are to be are to be special so as to set them apart as a special class of people. Now this is the first takeaway I would like you to get from this passage, that if this is something that God has commanded, then vestments cannot be evil in and of themselves. I bring this up because many people that I've met within the Restoration Brotherhood, they look down on vestments and they'll often use derogatory terms like pharisaical or Catholic. And that to me basically suggests that they think this idea comes from human origin. Well, such a mindset, however, however just fails to wrestle with the reality that God has at times in the past given his stamp of approval to the use of vestments. And I do contend that any idea that comes from God must be a holy idea within, with its, within its own right. Now go ahead and skip down to Exodus 28.33, there near the end of the passage. The next point I would like to make is that these kind of garments are not cheap to make. The description here has blended colors of threads using blues, purples, crimson, and gold. The bells are made out of solid gold. 
There's a plate on the turban that's made out of solid gold. The breastplate is overlaid with gold. It's suspended by gold chains, and it displays 12 semi-precious colored gemstones. I don't know if I could stress this enough, but this outfit has some serious bling attached to it. And as we noted before, the purpose is to give the office of the priest a sense of glory and a sense of beauty. Now, most vestments, even today, still cost an arm and a leg to make. Uh, this monetary sacrifice to make such clothing suggests that religious rituals and an ordained priesthood to perform those rituals are important and worthy of an offering that will cost the people of God greatly. And even today, if you look up vestments for liturgical churches such as Anglican churches, Roman Catholic churches, or Eastern Orthodox churches, be prepared to experience a certain amount of price tag shock. I would just give you one example. The priestly vestment that is shown here on this slide costs over $4,000 to make. And keep in mind, that's the cost of a used car. And these vestments are only worn for a few hours or so on a day, and you can only wear certain colors certain times of the year. So, simply put, it is, it is expected that often a priest will own at least two sets of vestments, and maybe as many as ten, maybe more. Think about how much money is spent in a lifetime to have these kind of holy clothing made. And this would be one of the primary reasons right, why frontier churches will begin to shun costly vestments. That they are expensive to make, and in a land where money and luxuries are just hard to come by, they will seem superfluous to daily religious expression. Now, a third reality of vestments is that they serve as a uniform to set the minister apart. The Hebrew word for holy, kodesh, means to literally set something apart for sacred usage. These vestments served as symbols of God's holiness. Not just anyone could wear these garments, and a person needed to be properly ordained in order to have the authorization to wear them. For example, when Aaron, the first high priest, was about to die, his vestments are ritually taken off his body and placed on the body of his son, who is to become the next high priest. This is described in Numbers chapter 20, verse 25 through 28. And likewise, a person could profane the vestments and themselves by unholy actions. And in such cases, God would sometimes even allow the priest wearing the sacred vestment to be injured or killed in battle, as was the case with Eli. Now, it is worth noting that in this passage, Numbers chapter 20, the vestments are recycled. Eleazar does not have a new garment made for him when he assumes his father's role of high priest. The vestments are a symbol of the office, and they are utterly unique. And I'm assuming that this concept is a fairly novel idea to you as my students. This idea that a specific set of clothing was required for God's religion to even function, and without it, the religion could not be continued without a crisis of faith. And this, however, plays into one of the concepts that I had asked you to start thinking about at the start of the lecture. How do you think this world would be different if every saved believer wore something that testified to their faith? Would you act differently if you knew that people could tell that you were holy and set apart just by looking at your clothing? Would this put pressure on you to make sure that you were always representing your God well? One of the drawbacks to the Restoration Movement's dismissal of vest vestments for their ministers, elders and deacons for that matter, um, is that it will not be immediately obvious who is the minister at a specific church and been set apart specifically by their clothing. Indeed, when a visitor comes to a Restoration Movement church, they will have to ask around for quite a while to discover just who all the leaders are because there will not be any apparent signs based on clothing as to who does what jobs. So now, let's shift gears here a little, because not everything that the Bible has to say about vestments is positive. If I had to sum up the history of Old Testament Israel in a nutshell, it would be that the people of God consistently confused the symbols for the reality. 
just to give a few examples, Moses is told to create a bronze serpent, and eventually the people start to worship it, and it has to be destroyed during the reign of Josiah. Likewise, the people start to treat the temple of God as this kind of talisman that keeps them from harm. By Jeremiah, by Jeremiah's time, he is prophesying the destruction of the temple, that this holy object will not save them. A third example could be also from the time of Jeremiah, that people began to think of the Ark of the Covenant as offering divine protection. Jeremiah 3.16, God promises to remove it from Israel's presence. And I would like to point out that the same thing can be said for vestments. God gave the people stipulations on how to make these holy articles of clothing, things like the breastplate or the ephod. But one of the first references we have to things like the ephod outside of Exodus is when Gideon made one, and the people began to worship it. And the moral of this story is that vestments, like any symbol, even if it came directly from God, can be abused if a person's heart is not right with God. When this happens, the abuse usually sh takes the shape of treating the symbol like it is God instead of worshiping the God that the symbol is pointing towards. So now, when we get to the New Testament, we have absolute silence on the issue of Christian dress for the purposes of worship. Sure, we have admonitions that a Christian is to dress themselves modestly, but this is very different than having a prescription that vestments are required for worship to happen, certainly like we see in the Old Testament. Simply put, the New Testament lacks the equivalent of a book of Leviticus, and this will encourage both strict and loose constructual readings of the Bible when it comes to formulating Christian worship. In strict constructions, this lack of any statements about vestments will be taken as a prohibition. And this will, by and large, be the majority position of frontier churches in general, and it will certainly be the position of Restoration Movement churches in particular. Interestingly, however, it has been the historical position of the church to choose to adopt a very loose construction hermeneutic of the scriptural passages, and that... The evidence for this can be seen that virtually any church, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, even heretical churches, in between the years 300 and 1550 AD, will use some form of vestment. So with this in mind, let's look at a couple New Testament passages. Go ahead and pause for a second and read Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Okay, now that you've got that, the New Testament still affirms that the high priestly office is in effect, but instead of being the sole duty of Aaron and his sons, the Levitical priesthood, this privilege of high priest has now been commuted to Jesus of Nazareth. And I would like to point out that one of the biggest ironies of history is that the ultimate sacrifice by Jesus, our great high priest, did not happen to go along with some pretty robes and a great ceremony inside the temple. Instead, Jesus offered his sacrifice naked, lacking really any form of mandated temple artifacts. And some Protestants, like for example, Huldrych Zwingli and John Hopper, they will latch onto this idea when they begin their reformation. If Jesus did not require vestments for his sacrifice to be valid, then who are we to say that we need them today? And finally, there's this last New Testament idea I want us to discuss, and that's found in the second chapter of Peter's first epistle. Go ahead and take time to read uh, 2 Peter 2, 5 through 10. All right, now that you've got that, one of the chief doctrines advocated by the reformer Martin Luther and most Protestants will follow this notion, is that all Christians everywhere, all believers, constitute a royal priesthood. Now, this idea has taken many forms in the 500 years since Luther first articulated it. For example, the term priest has all but vanished from evangelical Christianity. 
Another example, the Sunday morning worship service is no longer seen as a sacrifice. But possibly one of the more subtle appropriations of this idea was the dismissal of formal vestments. After all, the purpose of a vestment is to make people stand out. They are meant to be a uniform that attributes a unique status to individual believers. But once the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers became the norm for evangelical Christianity, this idea of specialized clothing for the clergy also fell into disfavor. All of this points us in a particular direction, that the New Testament does not condemn the use of vestments. But the silence of the New Testament on the issue still must be dealt with. After all, people will wear something when they come to worship. So, the question of proper attire will always culturally be with us. But in dealing with this silence, Protestant commentators have often rejected the idea of vestments on the grounds that a. Christ did not wear a vestment while performing his ultimate sacrifice, and b. that the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers largely negates the idea that individual Christians need to have a set of clothing that communicates their status or their rank. So, let's shift gears here again and discuss a couple of the physical issues that have arisen concerning vestments basically since the era of the New Testament. And one of the earliest issues concerning vestments is that, as a cultic object, a foreign power or government could exceed a considerable amount of control over a religion if it could control the access to the holy vestments or garments. An example of this can be seen in uh, Josephus' account known as the Antiquities of the Jews in chapter 20, or sorry, book 20, chapter 1, verse 6. Josephus records that during the time of Jesus, a Roman governor by the name of Fadus kidnapped the vestments of the high priest as part of a power play for keeping the Jewish people in line. In summary, this governor of Judea figured that he could control the people and the priesthood in Jerusalem if he had say over when and where sac sacrificial rituals of the Torah could be observed. And this is a sort of theological warfare, and it will arise almost any time a specific object is necessary in order for, to hold a religious office properly. For example, when the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, the Jewish people will have a crisis of faith because that object, the temple, was necessary to conduct their worship. And part of this is because whoever controls the object often has the real power in a religious equation. And this was apparently one of the premier reasons why many Jewish groups or sects, such as the Essenes, figured that the priesthood in Jerusalem was illegitimate during the time of Jesus, simply because the Romans controlled access to the sacred vestments and that they were required in order to observe the law of Moses. As far as the Essenes were concerned, because the Romans controlled the vestments, they controlled the priesthood, therefore the priesthood is invalid. And even Jewish separatist communities, such as the Qumran community, exhibited a belief that when the Messiah would come, that he would stand by their cause, he would elevate the people of Qumran into a new priesthood. And so to be ready for this, they were making new vestments and new cultic temple utensils and furniture. And all this can be seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so my point from all of this is that when you have objects, and those objects are necessary for worship to happen, a person can exhibit an extreme amount of control by trying to control who can get to those objects and who can't. So let's move on to some distinctly Christian issues with vestments. Even without a command from the New Testament authorizing Christians to use and make vestments, the sheer force of historical inertia would have been just too great to overcome. After all, every religion, including Judaism, made use of vestments for telling the laity apart from the clergy. And as Christianity became a legal religion in the Roman Empire after 311 AD, the need arose for Christians to be able to, to tell, at a glance, who the clergy was and who wasn't. And 
In some ways it was a natural development that happened, but what I want to stress here is that this development happened because of pragmatism, and not because of a New Testament mandate. Vestments were simply a socially accepted aspect of religious life, but the issues that correspond with vestments became baggage that has surfaced over and over again throughout Christian history. And one of the more surprising early developments it, we see is a notion that because often these vestments got their ideas from the Old Testament priesthood, that Christians began to believe that if a Christian priest was not properly dressed, then the worship service was somehow invalidated. And this is often where we get phrases like, the power vested in me that this idea is that the uniform grants certain rights and privileges to when it is properly worn and bestowed. And this innate sense of power that is invested in the holy garments could easily give rise to superstitions. Just for one example, when a particularly holy or beloved priest or bishop or martyr is killed or died, Christians would often collect their clothing and that it would serve as relics, and that they often believe that these relics contain special powers to perform miracles, just as Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons were supposedly able to perform miracles according to Acts 19.12. And the result of all this is that early on, Christians began to place an unbiblical and oftentimes unhealthy set of spiritual expectations on their vestments and on the people who wore them. Now, because the right to wear the symbols of the church were often seen by common people as access to spiritual power, again, one of these superstitions that rise up, one of the largest issues that the medieval church faced was this question of who held the right to give a bishop or a priest the symbols of their office, the sapphire ring, the crozier, their vestments. Basically, who had the right to give this person spiritual power? And this problem became particularly sticky because kings and emperors enjoyed giving land grants to bishops because the land would go back to the king's ownership when the bishop died. And this was very different from a secular land grant where a king would give a feudal lord a tract of land, and then when the lord died, his children would inherit his land. Now, the underlying problem behind all of this is the question, should a secular ruler have the power to give a person a sacred church office? Should a secular person have the right to give spiritual power to somebody? Well, after almost a century of squabbling between kings and pope, the agreement was struck at a, uh, at a meeting called the Concordat of Worms. The king would have a say in who got elected as bishop. He would be a part of the election process, but he would not be allowed to give the symbols of the spiritual office. And in many ways, this is the exact same problem Josephus records when Fadus kidnapped the vestments of the high priest. To control who can wear the uniform of the church is in reality the ability to control the church itself. Now, the rejection of vestments by the Restoration Movement and other frontier denominations will try to undercut this issue. Without vestments, there could be no physical cultic object that would allow for a secular ruler to control the church. But the drawback, of course, is that without a telltale uniform, anyone could claim to be clergy. And we will see this theme happen over and over and again, as many in the Restoration Movement will denounce vestments as anti-New Testament. But they will also lack formal or ordination. Basically, they will say, I don't need a uniform to be clergy, but mainly because the types of churches giving out uniforms and ordaining as clergy won't have anything to do with them. In some ways, it's a case of sour grapes. So, by now you're probably wondering, when did the Protestants start, stop wearing vestments if they had been so important to the majority of Christians worldwide. I mean, even today, they're still important to some Christian groups. So why did Protestants begin to stop 
putting such emphasis on vestments? Well, early on, the first of the anti-vestment backlashes came from a theologian named Ulrich Zwingli. He is a reformer from the town of Zurich, which is in Switzerland. Zwingli had a very strong iconoclastic streak to him. I mean, he ordered the whitewashing of the walls in his church. He dismantled the organ, even though, quite frankly, he was a decent musician. He just thought organ had no place in church. And he did away with just about anything if it struck him as part of the rubbish heap of ceremonials that came with the Catholic Church. Now, Zwingli is also the first Protestant reformer to do away with vestments. But he did so because it was part of this larger paradigm that Zwingli wanted the Bible to be the primary symbol that was in use in any of his churches. And this will be one of the few times that the early advocates of the Restoration Movement are in total agreement with Zwingli. For example, Calvin would reject Zwingli's ideas of baptism, Stone would reject Zwingli's ideas of reliance on creeds. But on the American frontier, Zwingli's iconoclasm will win the day with regards to church aesthetics. And because of this, frontier churches and restoration movement churches will be very plain. They will lack pictures and icons, and most of them will lack things like vestments. So now, the turning point for English-speaking Christians with regards to vestments will come around 1550, when King Edward VI, who is King of England, will try to ordain John Hooper. Now, about a decade after Zwingli died, Hooper traveled to Switzerland, and he made friends with a man named Heinrich Bullinger, who, for all intents and purposes, was Zwingli's successor at, as reformer in the city of Zurich. And it's here that Hooper developed an early version of what will often be called Puritan theology. And this theology will dominate English theological thought for the next century after Hooper's death. But by 1550, Hooper had moved back to England. He was highly influenced by Zwingli and Bullinger's ideas. And after this, he is offered to take the office of bishop of a city called Gloucester. Now, when he's made the offer to become bishop, Hooper will explicitly refuse to wear the vestments that are customary for bishops at his ordination. And this decision landed him in some pretty hot water, and eventually it landed him even in prison for a short amount of time. So, take a look at these two pictures in the slide, and let's examine what Hooper exactly refused to do. The picture on the left, we see a bishop dressed in a full set of vestments. Notice the hat. The technical term for this hat is called a mitre, and it symbolizes exactly what it looks like. It's a crown. In Roman Catholicism, a bishop is known as a prince of the church. Now look at the staff that is in the left hand there. The staff is known as a crozier, and just like a shepherd's staff, it symbolizes the bishop's authority to pull back wayward believers, pull them back from bad doctrine, and from anything else theologically that could harm them. Now notice the ring on the right hand there. The ring is a sapphire ring, and it symbolizes the bishop's marriage to the church. And this is in lieu of a physical marriage to a woman, that the bishop is not allowed to get married. His wedding has already happened, and it was to the church. And notice how every one of these symbols is in some way, shape, or form a declaration of power. It says, this bishop has been given authority. And each one of these articles of clothing is a demonstration of that authority. Now, Hooper's refusal to wear the traditional vestments is a blatant challenge to existing power structures, both to Roman Catholic power structures and even to Protestant or early Protestant Anglican power structures. Notice how he's dressed. It's a fairly simple white shirt, a ruffled collar, which looks somewhat audacious to us today, but in his day would have been quite normal. His vest is rather plain. 
And notice what's in his hand, a Bible. In this picture, one of the sources that Hooper is saying my authority comes from is the scriptures. Notice he's pointing to the Bible with one hand and holding it upright with the other. For Hooper, he doesn't need a crown, a ring, or a crozier to tell people where his authority comes from. In many ways, he simply points to the book and says, this is where my authority comes from, not in how I'm dressed. It is also worth noting that Hooper admitted that his position on vestments was not based on scriptural prohibition. He, in other words, he was intellectually honest enough to say the New Testament does not say anything condemning the use of vestments. And so in this regard, Hooper actually asserted that vestments are an indifferent matter. They are neither good nor bad in and of themselves. But Hooper's primary objection was that tradition could be dangerous and that he did not want to set a bad precedent. Now, historian David Steinmetz describes it this way in his book, Reformers in the Wings, quote, Hooper's refusal to wear vestments or to be consecrated in the normal way quickly inflated to a cause celebre. Hooper and those later Puritan divines who shared his convictions were thoroughly convinced that what was not commanded in Scripture ought not to be instituted in the church. Hooper did not deny the outright category of indifferent or indifferent matters, but he astutely observed that things regarded by one generation as indifferent are quickly hallowed by time and usage and regarded by the next generation as things essential. In short, Hooper feared that if you set a standard in one generation, it will become essential to the next, and he didn't want to run that risk. And this paradigm will be crucial for understanding many of the theological positions of the first generation um, advocates of the Restoration Movement these people will have a very deep mistrust in tradition. And they will have this mistrust because it offered a competing source of authority to the scriptures themselves. Now, ironically, a problem will develop that the example of many of these first-generation restoration movement advocates will eventually become a tradition in and of itself. And we will see this over and over again, that there is a tension between scripture and human innovation. And nearly every theological debate within the Restoration Movement, pretty much from its beginning up until the present, will center around this problem of reading the scripture and specifically responding to human need and the human drive to go and innovate religiously. Now, I want to introduce you to a technical term here before we close, and that technical term is that the refusal to adhere to church tradition and to specifically rely solely on the New Testament is called New Testament liturgicism. What this means is that all of our liturgical ideas, whether it be how we worship, what songs we sing, what types of rite or ritual we do, are all focused on New Testament example or New Testament precedent. And such a practice brings up a very interesting question. How can the New Testament be considered scripture, the kind of scripture that is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, when it is so conveniently ignored for establishing church worship practices? Now, this development will, will reach its maturity around 1816, when Alexander Campbell will deliver his famous Sermon on the Law. And this sermon will virtually strip the Old Testament of any authority to set a precedent for Christians today. So, as we conclude this lecture, let's foreshadow how this state of affairs will play itself out between the years 1800 and 1900 within the Restoration Movement. For starters, the backlash against vestments will go hand-in-hand hand with a strict, constructual hermeneutic of the reading the Bible. Simply put, if an idea is not in the New Testament, Restoration Movement advocates will say it should be avoided. And all of these early Restoration Movement pioneers will cling to this hermeneutic, 
and they will usually put the results of this way of reading scripture as a contrast between a perceived tyranny of tradition. That reading the Bible and getting your ideas from the Bible is good, and that any reference to tradition must by of itself be bad. Now, secondly, Restoration Movement ministers and preachers will adopt a fairly casual dress code. Now, don't misunderstand me here. They still dressed in their Sunday best, but when they went out preaching, they chose not to wear distinctive vestments or uniforms that would distinguish them from the common person. For example, the sketch that I've included on this slide is from the Cane Ridge Revival of 1801. And shown in this slide, we see Barton Stone pictured here preaching from atop a tree stump. Notice he's also not behind his pulpit. This is simply out in the open on a tree stump. But notice how his style of dress here is not different from all the other men gathered around to hear him preach. On the American frontier, this will be the norm, and the preachers of the Restoration Movement will simply accept that this norm is the approved biblical precedent. And finally, there will be a distinctive rhetoric in the Restoration Movement to dismiss churches that do use vestments as being somehow under the influence of traditions, and under the influence of Roman Catholicism in particular. And this rhetoric still exists in many forms today, as Restoration Movement preachers are inclined to call such robes popish rags, as Campbell did, or pharisaical inventions. But after the study, however, I'm sure you're beginning to become aware of just how complex this question can be, and that no simplistic argument will really do it justice. So, thank you for your time, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time when we discuss Calvinism and how well it fared in the frontier churches.